So please welcome our speaker, Dr. James Dasher. Oh. Well, thanks, Leslie. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. Uh, thanks, um, thanks for coming out, uh, folks. Uh, I'd just like to acknowledge we're on Treaty 7 territory, and um, I bring you greetings from Treaty 4 territory, where it's still really flat. Um, uh, I'd just like to thank the organizing committee. I'd like to acknowledge uh, Elder Herman uh, for coming out. Thank you for coming out. And um, I guess we should get on with this. And, and Leslie, I guess, uh, basically started my talk with me. Or uh, 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 for me, uh, and I've got. I'm not going to really apologize on this. Last night I gave a talk uh, to a group of Ukrainian senior citizens. Okay, they invited me. My last name is Daschuk. I'm more French Canadian than I am Ukrainian, but I was invited to to speak to them, and I was kind of nervous because it's basically the same talk as I'm going to give you folks, right? And uh, I guess talking about history is about the present. Well, those Ukrainians, the senior citizen Ukrainians, were all informed by the Holodomor famine. I'm, I'm not, is everyone familiar with that? In 1932 and 33, the Soviet government essentially starved three, three and a half million Ukrainians. Okay, so it was a terrible famine and everyone in that room knew all about it. And they knew about the oppression that the Soviets had incurred on their cousins, on their relatives back in the Ukraine. And so what I did was, you know, it's like uh, we made a, a connection on that level, and then I told them my story, or I'll tell, tell you, I guess, the story that we're going to talk about tonight. So, again, history is about the present. Uh, we as historians can and do rewrite history all the time, or else we'd be out of business, right? So what we do is we give meaning to past events. Really, that's, that's what we try to do. And uh, we've got a process of due diligence. So if the story I'm about to tell you was different in the documents, I'd be telling you a different story, but this is the way things happen. Uh, and I guess just as an introduction, this is a political cartoon from the eight, 1880s, and you can see here John A. MacDonald is acting as the, you know, the, the police officer with his billy club, and what he's doing is he's opening the West for the throngs of settlers, but in doing so, he's basically pushing the indigenous people into the Pacific Ocean. So what he's like, you know, this is, you know, uh, I guess a picture tells a thousand words. Now, uh, there, Mary mentioned uh, truth and reconciliation. One of the, one of the wise things that the, the commissioners of the TRC did was they, uh, they challenged us all, not just for the government to do things, but they got all of us to take up the challenge of 94 calls to action. And I'm not sure what call to action this is, somewhere in the 60s, I lost count. But really what they want to do is, they thought it was very important for citizens to become historically literate and to find out that <laughs> present relationships that, that are you know, at play right now have historical roots. And really, that's what, uh, that's what my thesis was all about. That's what my work is all about. Now, I, I think Leslie mentioned this. Before Canada annexed the West, before they, they took over the West, First Nations people who hunted bison were the tallest population in the world. Okay? So for, since time immemorial, people had been eating a high protein, low fat diet, and basically as much as they wanted. So uh, things had changed, there had been epidemics, but when Canada acquired the territory known as Rupert's Land, I guess to the <laughs> Europeans, uh, the food situation was quite good. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit about food. Now this is, this is the land that Canada bought the rights from the Hudson's Bay Company in 1869. It was indigenous territory, but the, the Hudson's Bay Company had a royal charter from 1670, so 200 years old by this time. And the HBC didn't want to be the government of that massive territory. So in 1869, they worked out a deal with the, the young Dominion of Canada. And for 300,000 pounds, they didn't buy the land, they bought the right to enter that land. And we'll talk about that in a second. So it wasn't exactly a real estate transaction because you can see here, this is, uh, all of these different colors represent different numbered treaties. So from the Royal Proclamation, which was the, uh, which was the formal peace treaty of the Seven Years' War, the first British document that really uh, talked about um, Canada, the land that we become Canada, there was an acknowledgement that First Nations people owned their land. So the way to think about this is, without treaties, without those numbered treaties, it would have been against the law for our ancestors to enter this territory or any of the other territory that was inhabited by First Nations people. 
Now, another thing, you see that these are all different colors. And uh, that's a good representation for what was going on on the ground during the 1870s. We're, of course, in Treaty 7 territory here. But each of, each of those different colors represents a geographical conflict. So it wasn't a grand plan in the 1870s to settle the West. It wasn't like a big vision. What it was, actually from Treaty 4 territory, I wrote my master's thesis on the, the, the office politics of the Geological Survey of Canada. Okay? That shows that you can write a master's thesis about anything, but okay? there was a crew of geological surveyors in 1873, and what they were doing was they were traveling through southern Saskatchewan. They didn't ask the Cree and the Soto if they could enter that territory. They were looking around for uh, coal mines, and they were looking around for natural resources. Well, because they were trespassing on indigenous territory, the First Nations, basically guardians of the land, escorted them off that territory at gunpoint. Like, you guys can come back, we've worked out a deal. So, the next year, uh, Alexander Morris, who was the representative of Queen Victoria, entered that territory, went to Fort Capel, and completed Treaty 4. Uh, what I want to tell you about is Treaty 6. Oh, and really, here's the Coles notes of of treaties. What was the purpose of treaties? Well, again, I guess repeating myself, from the Crown's perspective, there needed to be a surrender of land. The ownership had to, had to be transferred from the Indigenous people to the government, right? To open the land up for our ancestors, those of us who are descended from, from, uh, from settlers. But to First Nations people, they knew that the white people were coming, and there really wasn't a lot they could do to stop them. So what they wanted to do was, in, in entering into a treaty, there was going to be a bridge to what was really an uncertain future. And agriculture is talked about in all of the treaties. So the, the bridge to the future, to a successful, prosperous future, was farming. Okay? And I wrote down just so I would remember. Think of this as a deal versus a relationship. Okay? So, I don't know, we who deal with lawyers, you want to sign on the dotted line and you've got the contract, everything's good. But the other way to think about this, and this is probably a more indigenous perspective, is this is about a relationship. So we're gonna get married. And I'm just plugging my, uh, my friend's books. If anyone's interested, there's actually a, a, a fine book, The True Spirit and Intent of Treaty 7, that was written a few years ago. I'm sure it's at chapters and different bookstores. And that would give the, the, uh, the Blackfoot perspective on, on Treaty 7. Now, this is, a, this is an image I got from Glenbow Archives in Calgary. And what it is, is this represents the gathering at Fort Carleton and the negotiations for Treaty 6. So Treaty 6 was negotiated in late August of 1876. And when I tell my students, I've shown this uh, just a couple weeks ago in my class. What I told the students was, the way to think about this is this is only a couple of months after the Battle of the Little Bighorn, Custer's last stand. Okay, so everybody knows what happened to Custer at the last stand, okay? So everyone who was gathered at Fort Carlton knew what had happened at the Little Bighorn. Nobody wanted violence, but each side, the Plains Cree, representing their nation and their territory, and the Crown, came to Fort Carlton representing their position from a, from a side of strength. Like, no one was, no one was tricking the other, the other party. So the negotiations at Fort Carlton were actually... Uh, quite long, they were over several days, and they were real negotiations. You can see in Alexander Morris's uh, Treaties of Canada, which is still in print 140 years later, that there is a real negotiation going on. And I, do, I won't tell you the whole story, but what I do want to do is I want to talk about Chief Beardy. And Chief Beardy is honored today. Uh, there's a First Nation, Beardy's and Okamasa's First Nation. It's between Saskatoon and Prince Albert, quite close to, uh, to Fort Carleton. And in, the, in Alexander Morris's version of, of events, Chief Beardy says, if we allow you white people into our territory, I'm very concerned, and using, I guess, modern terminology, about food security. He knew that, that agriculture, large-scale agriculture, was incompatible with the bison hunt. So he said, if we allow you into this territory, we know the bison are gonna disappear at some point. No one was really sure when. And so what they ended up doing was, they talked about a promise of food aid in a time of famine. And then there's a negotiation, you don't get free food every day, don't want food, free food every day. And this is what Alexander Morris says, well, if a great bull comes on, on the Indians, old school terminology, they would not be allowed to die like dogs. And actually Chief Beardy used that terminology, like we don't want to die like dogs if there's a famine. So after the negotiations, 
This is, this is what is known as the famine and pestilence clause of Treaty 6. Treaty 6 actually has the most words of any of the numbered treaties. And I won't be one of those guys that reads this PowerPoint slides, but I underlined a couple things. Uh, in a general famine, the, the queen or an agent will grant Indians assistance necessary and sufficient to relieve the Indians from the calamity. So the way I think about this, the way I explain this to my students is, this was one of the principles that completed the negotiation of Treaty 6. This is the foundation of basically the society that came after us. All of us who are ancestors, our ancestors came here, it was based on that promise. And in exchange, it would open the land up again for our, uh, for our ancestors. Well, what no one really planned on was within 18 months of that treaty being signed and that promise being made, the bison disappeared forever. And I'll give you a heads up, there are a couple kind of gory slides, so I apologize, but it, Picture's worth a thousand words. You can see that this is a mountain of bison skulls, maybe a hundred thousand more or more bison skulls. The bison disappeared over the winter of 1877-78. There are a whole bunch of reasons, I'll get into that in a second. But the Mounties were actually in this territory and uh, they had physicians with them. And at that time, the Mounties came out here to shut down the, the whiskey trade and actually I think they ad acted as advocates in the early years. And the physician said, conditions have totally changed from last fall into this spring. People are coming in sick and they're coming in hungry. And really what it was was the, the, their food had disappeared, food they relied on for millennia. Well, one of the biggest uh, pressures on the bison was south of the border. And this is an image from the States called 40,000 buffalo hides. Uh, so this image is probably quite close to some railroad tracks in the United States. And what the idea is, is that hunters would come out and shoot as many bison as they could, skin the animals, 40,000 I guess on a good day, and send the hides back, back east to be tanned and used for all kinds of purposes. Of course, that was totally unsustainable. The, the, the meat of 40,000, just off camera, would just be left on the plains to rot. So the food, like the, you know, the food was wasted in a totally unsustainable industry. In addition to hide hunting, the American military went on a campaign to destroy the herds so they could quote unquote pacify the Native American population and get them to live on reserves. So with all of those things, oh, and one of the reasons, one of the, one of the big, um, I guess, destinations for those bison hides was industrial revolution factories. You can see those belts. Well, while bison hides were still available, those were the prime quality belts because they were thicker and more durable than cowhide. So, and the reason why we're not tripping over them, and this, uh, this image is probably from, from near Regina, and obviously after the Canadian Pacific is, uh, is built, the reason why we're not tripping over thousands of bones even today, even though Regina's nickname is Pile of Bones, Oscana in Cree, someone got the idea that the settlers would come out in the first few years, so they would bring all of their gear to live in a sod house or whatever they're gonna do, they're moving west, and for the first couple of years, before farms were really set up and before there was a crop, the, the freight cars were going back east empty. So someone got the bright idea to pay people a few pennies to bring the bones to the railroad tracks and they'd fill up the, uh, the freight cars with bones. And then what they'd do is they'd, they'd grind them up and use them for industrial purposes. So they'd use them for fertilizer and, and possibly not in this case, they would use them for fine bone china. So if you had the right kind of plate, I'm not saying everyone's fine china is made from buffalo with bison bone, but if you had the right kind of plate from the right time at the right place, there was a good chance actually that there would be bison bones in your porcelain. Now, getting back to the more important story, I guess, what few Canadian officials were out west in the spring of 1878 did what they could. Agent Dickinson was one of the very few Indian agents representing the Canadian government. He told his bosses, I need 350 cattle a day, 10,000 a year. This is a famine and we've got to, like, we've got to buck up and we've got to do something. Now, there were no civil service credentials in the 1870s, okay? So Dickinson was a liberal, okay? A few, he only lasted a few months into the famine because in the fall of 1878, John A. Macdonald and the Conservative Party were returned to power, okay? So he ended up, Dickinson, who I think acted in good faith, left the civil service. He might have gotten fired, but I'm not really sure about that. So 
I think this crowd is old enough, mature enough, uh, to know about the national policy, right? The, the platform of the Conservatives was to build a railway to, to British Columbia from Ontario as quickly as possible. So we all know that story from grade six or whenever it was, but something we probably hadn't heard about was that from the time of his re-election, John A. Macdonald in 1878 was the Superintendent General of Indian Affairs for 10 years. So he, he had a different title, but he was essentially the Minister of Indian Affairs for, from 78 to 88. And even in 2018, that is the longest tenure of any Minister of Indian Affairs in Canadian history. And it's just after the treaties were negotiated, so that's when the relationship is really being set up. Now, what's happening? Oh yeah, and I'll just give you, um, I'll give you a little bit of background. To not finish my thesis that Leslie was talking about, I read every issue of the Saskatchewan Herald newspaper from 1878 to, I think, 1896. It was only four pages a week. Now, this is, this is not news. This is in the WAN ads right next to the snake oil ad uh, from December of 1878. Okay? And some of you may have seen, seen me read this before, but it says, found where the Indians starved to death about the 1st of October, a white mare. Owner can have same by approving property, blah, blah, blah. Now this is from Battleford, Saskatchewan, and you know about Battleford and all the trial that's been going on. Battleford was actually uh, a, one of the few white settlements in Western Canada. And the idea for Battleford, I guess the geographical reason for Battleford existing at this time, was the original plan to build the railway was going to go through Winnipeg and Edmonton, kind of on the Yellowhead Highway, like Highway 16. The railway was going to have to cross a bridge at Battleford. So if they were to build a bridge, everyone who'd set up shop in Battleford would have gotten rich. And of course, that didn't really pan out, but we'll, we'll get into that. So this is a couple things. The fact that by December of 1878, a First Nations person had starved to death wasn't even news anymore. It's also a sign of how racist the guy who ran the Saskatchewan Herald was, because he's you know, not, uh, not making it news. Now, the bison disappeared across the West. So the Blackfoot people, people who are living here, many of them traveled up to Battleford in an attempt to get, to get some kind of food. And you can see here, Agent Dickinson, before he retired, said many of them are dying because they could not subsist on a diet of roots. So people are traveling hundreds of kilometers. It's probably 600 kilometers to Battleford from Lethbridge, right? So people are traveling that far to find food assistance. Another thing that happened in, in 78 and 79 was that hungry people were provided with rations as payment to build a fence around the ration house to keep them out of the ration house, if you can follow that logic. Okay? So, and you can see here, even, even the racist newspaper reporter is saying, like, that they're, the indigenous people's um, um, condition is deplorable, and you know, their, their diet used to rely on animal food almost exclusively, and the rations of flour and tea they receive leave them but one remove from starvation. So that's a pretty Victorian poetic way to say these folks are on the edge, right? Now, McDonald took on his two jobs in the fall of 1878, okay? Over, that, over the next couple of months, he probably replaced the liberal civil servants with uh, conservative civil servants. That's just what the way things worked in those days. But those new civil servants were given, were given strong orders. And what it was, was that if an indigenous person was hungry and they hadn't adhered to treaty yet, they weren't your responsibility. So in order to be provided with food, First Nations people had to enter the treaty relationship. Okay, now I told you a couple of years earlier in 1876, it was a nation to nation negotiation from positions of mutual strength. By 1879, they're not doing that. And actually, within about 18 months, 11,000 people in Saskatchewan, that's a little more than half the population of Saskatchewan, took up treaties. And what that means is, is that they took up treaties in exchange for food. Okay, so like, talk about entering a contract under duress. And I showed this slide, actually, a couple years ago, I went to Little Pine First Nations and Poundmaker, and I showed the slide to the grade sevens, I think, at, at Little Pine. And you can see here in 1879, Little Pine was one of the chiefs that basically moved to his reserve in exchange for food. And really, that was a pretty sad message to tell, tell the kids of that community, 
Now, this is a kind of a sad and tragic uh, image. You don't see a lot of images. I think this is from Adolf Hungry Wolf's Blackfoot Papers. It's a, a beautiful series. And what this is, is this is a ration house. So you can see the people are looking through the cracks and like, the, you know, it's, it's a terrible, sad story. And really, oh, every reserve would have had a ration house. Probably every police post would have had a ration house as well, okay? And I've spoken to, to, to elders, to, to seniors, who remember their ration houses in their First Nations community, okay? Now, this is basically like a log shack, right? It's a, it's a storehouse. And remember, this is before the days of electricity. Now, this is, uh, this is another image I got from Glenbo, and this is inside the ration house. So the way I understand it is, you've got a couple of white officials. You see the guy with the mustache in the list. He's probably a farm instructor. He's not even an Indian agent. He's a lower level official. And he's probably the bad boy son of some conservative in Ontario that they're trying to get rid of. So all of, those, all of those women, I think they're all women in line, are basically reporting to the farm instructor. And they're saying, I'm Mrs. So-and-so, I have three children. And you can see he's checking his list. And the main, the main focus on the rationing system was economy. So what happened was every single ration was weighed out, okay? And one of the rations was 12 ounces of flour a day. Another ration that I read was eight ounces of flour a day. So that's a cup of flour a day. And then you can see that they're gonna go over and see the butcher. He's already got his scale and he's gonna cut basically some kind of salted meat. And one of the rations was four ounces of bacon. So that would be your entire food for, for, for the day or for, uh, for the time. And this was so institutionalized that by the 1890s, Okay, this, and this one is from Treaty 7 territory, that you actually, it's, it's institutionalized. So I used to be a paper boy when I was a kid, and some, you know, somebody would pay the 65 cents for the newspaper, you'd stamp the card, and then there was no negotiating about when you could come back or when you would come back for the thing. So this is how institutionalized this was, and like I said, this lasted well into the 20th century. Okay. Now, as that ration system, as... Uh, as, uh, what would you want, parsimonious, I guess is a word to call it. As that's going down, okay, people working for the Indian Department are writing down what they see. And if anybody, uh, I'm sure the University of Lethbridge has these, every annual report from Indian Affairs and every other uh, government ministry was printed up in something called the Sessional Papers. And I'm sure in 1880 or 1879, the person writing the, those Sessional Papers, their report and having them typed up, wasn't thinking about some jackass like me in, you know, in 2018 reading these things and telling you about it. But they're really, to my, from my estimation, there wasn't much spin. They're just calling it like they see it because really they're just reporting to their boss. And you can see here, 150 lodges of Blackfeet, young men a few months before had been stout and hardy, reduced to perfect skeletons. And a little bit later, men, women, and children were reported to have died at Blackfoot Crossing at Siksika from absolute want of food. So they're reporting to their boss, and their boss is John A. MacDonald. And MacDonald actually signs these reports, the annual reports. Here's another one. Edgar Dudney, who was the, uh, he was John A. MacDonald's lieutenant in the West, his most trusted, I guess, uh, servant out here. He came west as the Indian commissioner, but he later became lieutenant governor of the Northwest Territories because he was doing such a good job. He ended up spending a couple weeks with the food contractor. He was probably on the take, actually, from the food contractor, I.G. Baker of Fort Benton, Montana. But what he did was, as he was traveling through uh, southern Alberta and into southern Saskatchewan, and for his first time, he was from British Columbia, he kept a diary. So, you can see in his diary, 1,300 people, strong young men, now some could hardly walk. So that's actually corroborating what the other report says. And uh, I apologize for the poor quality of these slides. I made them myself. You can see here that this is from the front page of the Saskatchewan Herald, and this is from Dece December 1st, 1879, so a year after that one ad. And what the first line of the second column says is, over 25 had died of actual starvation in the camp at Blackfoot Crossing. So that's at Siksika Reserve. People are actually dying of starvation. They're not just like malnourished, they're actually dying. Now, the people responsible for First Nations health the work, people working for the Indian Department have very strict rules at this time about how much food 
was to be allotted, right? But people were going down to Fort Benton and buying tons of food, like literally tons of food. As Dickinson said, I need 350 cattle a day. So very soon after this, you get into the absurd situation of food in ration houses. You remember the ration house from a couple slides ago. Food in the ration houses rotting while people went hungry in the communities. It was intended for the people, but it wasn't making it. Here's an example. So this Touchwood Hills are just a little bit, maybe about an hour, an hour and 15 minutes northeast of Regina, north of Fort Capel, if anybody knows that area. And this is a farm instructor writing to his boss. Now he's actually asking for better food, but what he says is the pork, and this is some kind of salt pork, it's bacon or side pork or something like that, is both musty and rusty, totally unfit for use. Although we're giving it out to the Indians in the absence of anything better, but we can't use it ourselves. So he's actually, like, he's asking for better food, but he's, he's admitting that he is supplying food that is musty and rusty. And there are, in the Indian Affairs reports, there are many, many reports, and actually Johnny McDonald compliments the Indian agent from around Edmonton, because what he did was he used his initiative to re-cure bacon that had gone bad. So think about that one. So just talking about the, the, uh, the condition of, of the food. Now, I was telling you about farm instructors, then there were Indian agents, and then above them was the management level, and they were the superintendents of, of, of Indian agencies. So T.P. Wadsworth is, uh, was, a, I guess, a player in that, uh, in that realm. So here's his report from 1883 in the Capel Valley. So he's talking about the shortage shown in statements of flour and bacon. So the bacon wasted, okay, very much during the heat last summer to my, okay, so you got that log cabin, you've got bacon. It's probably a side of bacon in a burlap bag hanging up from the ceiling to keep the mice away from it, okay? So during the heat, when I took stock last number, so there was a lot of heat, there was as much as half an inch of congealed grease upon the mud floor of the storehouse. So that bacon had gotten so warm that it dripped onto the floor. And because Wadsworth was interested in the buildings, he was giving the Indian agent heck for not maintaining, like, hey, you didn't clean up your floor. He's not actually concerned about the food. Now, I'm in the wrong crowd for talking about <laughs> cowboys and cow drives. Okay, I will do my best as an amateur <laughs> Uh, cowboy historian, okay? Something, something else to think about. So you've got all of this food, food's going bad, okay? And the opening of the ranch frontier, okay, from 1865, the end of the American Civil War, to the 1890s, has been called the largest supervised migration of herd animals in human history. Something like 12 million animals, maybe 15 million cattle were driven north from Texas to places like this, but also to Edmonton and to Regina. So the, the cattle drive probably would have started in Texas, right? That's where most of the cattle originally came from. So it's, Texas is a very good uh, replica of the environment of Spain. So think like, you know, so cattle were doing fine in Texas. But you've got to travel, you've got to push those cows 2,000 kilometers, maybe 2,500 clicks if you're going to Edmonton. And those animals had to be moved, had to be driven every single day. So you might start in Texas when the weather's fine, but by the time you make it, say, to Regina, this is what things are going to look like. Plus, your cattle have been pushed 50, 60 clicks a day, I don't know. But when they got here, some of those cattle look like this. Okay? And uh, this, is a, this is actually a famous painting from Charlie Russell, the Montana artist. And this is a quote from an American doctor uh, from Dakota. And what he was talking about was he realized that many of the cattle that were being driven north were being pushed so hard that they were getting sick. And something I didn't really know about until uh, I guess I did my research on it was that uh, cattle are primary hosts of tuberculosis. I'm sure many of you know a lot more about that than I do. But cows can be sick with TB and infectious with TB and not die. Now, if a if a malnourished, immune-suppressed human eats those cows, they're going to get sick with clinical TB. And this is what Dr. Treon said. Supposing that one in a thousand cattle infected with TB, the manner, and people shared food so they would kill one cow and everyone would eat, and you can see here, uh, it's uh, uh, possible, even probable, that a hundred persons may become inoculated from a single animal. So TB, which is very, very rare 
in the early 1870s. I spent a year and a half working as a researcher at the medical school, not finding tuberculosis in the fur trade journals. By 1880, it was the primary cause of sickness and death among First Nations people, okay? So, uh, and what that was is that's a factor of malnutrition and poverty and immune suppression. I apologize for this one, any horse lovers out there. So you've got meat that's going bad on reserves. You've got potentially infectious fresh animals but you also have people so hungry that there are many, many cases of uh, desperate people eating animals that have died of disease. And I won't read this one out loud, but it's pretty racist from the, the Herald. And really what happens is, is a horse died on the street. So there's a, a group of women that come and butcher the horse and take the meat back to their community. And you can see the guy jokes and actually mocks their suffering. We did not attend that powwow. So that's how desperate people were, like they were just trying to survive, okay? Now, that first, first or second slide I showed you about the tallest in the world, okay? The bison supplied one of the most nutritious diets on earth. It also supplied clothing and basically dwellings, right, teepees. So during this famine, when not enough food was being delivered to reserves, there was no, no contingency for clothing. Okay, so this is, one, and there are many, many references to the absence of clothing. This is uh, from uh, the Indian agent in Edmonton. And you can see here where I underline, many of the children were going naked with several adults being barefoot in the dead of winter. So this is like a whole cascading thing where people are malnourished, they're eating whatever they can, and now they don't have any clothes, okay? And that's a picture of Edgar Dudney and his spouse, and I guess they're dogs. And Edgar Dudney wrote a report that he wanted, to, like he was kind of scandalized that women on one of the reserves were working in the fields without any clothing at all. And it wasn't that he was concerned about the women being naked. What happened was his wife had taken a tour and was kind of scandalized in her Victorian way that people were being naked. So he was actually not working in the people's interest. He was, I guess, defending his, uh, his wife's uh, attitudes. Now, I've, I've mentioned the fact that the, uh, the Famine and Pestilence Clause was a cornerstone for the completion of Treaty 6. Super important, and those are legally binding documents that continue to, to operate today. Well, only nine years after the signing of Treaty 6 and that promise was made, MacDonald was called before a commission. This is in the aftermath of the, 18, the violence in 1885. And what he says is, oh no, can't be, like the food situation can't be considered a fraud on the Indians because they're living on Dominion charity. And then McDonald never wanted to miss a, a joke, like as the old adage says, beggars can't be choosers, right? So this guy's the minister, like he's the prime minister, but he's also the minister of Indian affairs. So he's either denying the fact that they made that promise or he doesn't even know about it, which is just as bad, I guess. Now, I don't know if you can see this up in the, up in the cheap seats over there, but what this is, is this is a, the front page of a satirical magazine called The Grip. It was a liberal satirical magazine, political magazine. And you can see here, John A. MacDonald is giving bags of money to the food contractor. And the main food contractor at this time was I.G. Baker from, from Montana. So he's paying bags of money. And you can see in the, in the background there, those, uh, those people on reserve are not doing well at all, right? And there's a little sign back there that you can't read, but what it says is, starved by a Christian government. Okay, so um, I guess one of those pictures tells a thousand words. Now, words also say a thousand words, I guess. That's a mixed metaphor. This is what McDonald said in the House of Commons. So some of you might be thinking, Jim, you are a conspiracy theorist. I literally cut and pasted this from Hansard, the official record of the House of Commons, okay? So on May 3rd, 1880, McDonald is, and this is not for me to be anti-conservative, okay? He, in, this, in, the, in the context of this, McDonald is being criticized by the liberal opposition for spending too much money on food. Okay, hey, what are you guys spending all that money for? Well, what McDonald says is, okay, perhaps sometimes we have fed people when they're not in an extreme position of hunger and starvation, okay? But later on he says, it's by being rigid, even stingy in the distribution of food, and require absolute proof of starvation before distributing it. So he's saying, like, we're not wasting the taxpayer's money, we're keeping people on the verge of starvation. Come on, like we're being fiscally responsible. 
A couple years later, as the railway is making its way to Regina, the railway got to Regina in 1882, again, he's being criticized for, for spending money. And they're spending, they probably are spending 500,000, maybe a million dollars by this time. But you can see, okay, sometimes First Nations people have been helped. But by this time, I was telling you about people were forced to enter treaty and take up reserves, okay? So we'll get to that in a minute. But you can see now they've been reduced to one half and one quarter rations. So now that they're, they're on reserve, the government control how much food they're, they're, that is provided to them. And we can't allow them to die for food, but we're doing all we can by refusing food until the Indians are on the verge of starvation to reduce the expense. Like, He's, like, he's basically boasting about this, right? Now, this is his accountant, Lawrence Manganette. He sort of repeats the, uh, repeats the refrain, you know, kept on starvation allowance. Okay. And you can see Edgar Dudney. And what they did was they forced people to work in exchange for rations, right? So, and as soon as the work was done, and it wasn't, you know, there's a lot of talk about assimilation, right? The government had an assimilationist policy. If they really had an assimilationist policy, they would have gotten them to work on the railway. But instead of working on the railway, the biggest mega project in Canadian history, probably even like relatively speaking in today's terms, they did Joe jobs on the reserve. They chopped wood, they dug ditches, like they just did things to like kind of busy work. So this is a picture of Edgar Dudney. You can see he's a pretty stout man, okay? One of the things uh, my research partner found on this was that one of the main uh, physical complaints, one of the main medical complaints of Indian department officials was gout. These guys were eating so much meat that they were making themselves sick, okay, as other people are going hungry. Now, 1882, the railway makes it to, well, makes it to Regina, and when I was reading those newspapers, it was halfway between the village of McLean and Moose Jaw, like that's really the reason why Regina exists. Anyhow, in the House of Commons, McDonald says, as the, uh, as the railway project is proceeding, in March of, of 1882, he says that all of the First Nations people in the territory of Assiniboia, which is southern Saskatchewan, will be removed by force if necessary. At this time, there were probably five or 7,000 mostly Cree people in the Cypress Hills. Really, all they were trying to do was eke out an existence, feed their children, and mind their own business. They asked if they could have reserves in that area, but because it was south of the railway, McDonald kind of construed this as a security threat. They really weren't a security threat. So what happens is, is that McDonald gives a new order to the people who's providing food, and it's like anybody who is south of the train tracks or south of the proposed train tracks, unless they start marching north, they don't get any food. And the last of the, the, last of the, uh, the major groups that basically uh, surrendered and entered treaty, and uh, to me it was a surrender, was the chief whose English name is Big Bear. And on uh, New Year's Eve of 1882, Big Bear went to Fort Walsh, and Fort Walsh had been basically the center of humanitarian aid in the Cypress Hills. Big Bear probably went in and he was back and forth into the United States. He was doing what he could basically to feed his people. Probably went in, it's like, where do I put my mark on treaty? Like my people are like, you know, starving. So Big Bear signs treaty, his people are given food and they're told to march north, okay? In the spring, like after, I don't know if they had this much snow, but in the spring, once the snow was gone, okay, the police were ordered to dismantle Fort Walsh and rebuild it a little ways north at Maple Creek to defend the railway. So in that, that kind of, uh, that construction project, the emphasis of the police changed from being advocates of First Nations people to being defender of the railway from First Nations people. Now, you can see here Saskatchewan, hard to spell, pretty easy to draw, right? Okay, now, all of those triangles represent First Nations. And there are 78, I haven't counted them, but somebody told me there are 78, okay? Now, in the territory that McDonald was talking about, this is Assiniboia, so it was its own territory. You can see Regina over there, Maple Creek is here. I guess we're over here somewhere. In that territory, out of 78 reserves, and probably some of the best bison hunting country in the northern Great Plains, okay, and the place, there are literally, I drove by more archeology span sites on my way here from Regina, uh, then you could shake a stick at. Like the place was, was full of people at one time during the bison hunting days. There are only two First Nations in all of that territory, 
So the first of them is right by Maple Creek. That's a, a Cree reserve called Nikanit. It's a Treaty 4 reserve. And Nikanit's people are almost, you ever hear that expression, the, um, the exception proves the rule? Well, Nikanit's people managed to stay in the Cypress Hills. And what they did was they helped the white people get established with their, with their ranches and their farms. So they worked as farm hands. And, and actually, it was after Chief Nikanit died in 1913. Uh, there was a survey and a very small reserve was provided to, I guess, Nikanit's community. And even a, more than 100 years later, we have a treaty land entitlement um, process in Saskatchewan. The provincial government is still providing land to Nikanit's people because the reserve was so small. Like they're still providing the, the reserve that, or land that they were entitled to back at treaty time. So that's Nikanit. And over here by Assiniboia, and this is uh, in the very dry central plains, is uh, a Dakota reserve called Wood Mountain. Okay, so after, uh, it's not very far from the French community of Willow Bunch, if any of you know about that. Um, and that reserve was only surveyed and set up and made an official reserve in the 1920s. So both of those communities were established and given reserve status after the white people had taken all the land that they wanted and basically, okay, you guys can have that little spot, wherever it might be. Oh yeah, and I was telling you about the Ukrainians, okay? And the Ukrainians were marginalized, like they were, they were immigrated to Canada, but they were like the second tier of immigrants. Along the Canadian Pacific Railway were Scottish people and British people, like the, the prime citizens, I guess, the, the, the prime candidates for settlement. And it's interesting that the reserves kind of mirror where the Ukrainians, where the Eastern Europeans settled in the, on the plains. And there are a lot of stories about Ukrainians being marginalized by the Scottish people and the British people. And uh, they're trading food and that kind of thing with First Nations people. So anyhow, that was just to give a bit of context. Now, I've just told you the crazy story of how basically Western Saskatchewan was ethnically cleansed of First Nations people. And, and no one has really uh, challenged me on that, on that term because people were forced out of that territory. Now, I also said that um, agriculture was known by First Nations people to be the key to a, a prosperous future, right? Well, it took, there were, I've been working on this uh, basically on some, on some uh, legal historical work. And there was never a serious effort to get agriculture going on reserves, even though that was promised in the treaties. There were so many bureaucratic hurdles, as you'll see, that agriculture never really worked in Saskatchewan. I know you, you folks were in ranching country. Also, when people moved to the reserves, they were dependent, they were even more dependent or reliant on, on Indian department officials for their food. So we get two instances here from the newspaper. Now, I don't know if this was, I don't think this was official government policy. This was a sign of how much power individual Indian department officials had. Excuse me. So this is from the newspaper in February of 1884. Chief Poundmaker, Plains Creek Chief, very highly regarded. But of course, in the newspaper, he's considered to be a troublemaker because he's advocating for his people. Anyhow, he, his band, you can see here I underlined the, the, the statement, because of his uh, considered activism, his band has been stricken off the ration roll. So Poundmaker is not punished. His entire community is cut off food. And a few weeks later, the, the Eagle Hill Stonies are the Nakoda people who live not too far from Battleford. They want to have a conversation with Edgar Dudney, who's the Indian commissioner. Well, you can see here, the talk was very short. They were ordered back to their reserve and to have eight days ration stop for leaving work without the instructor's permission. So think about the level of control. An entire community has cut off food, men, women, and kids, for eight days because somebody wants to talk to the Indian commissioner. Like, get, like, it's crazy. Now, I told you that uh, Prime Minister McDonald also had two jobs. So he is basically setting up this relationship. And what's his legacy? And I'm quote, this is a quote from uh, a more senior scholar than me, Dr. Jim Miller from U of S. He just retired. Uh, Dr. Miller is not a hothead activist. He's like a member of the Order of Canada, very balanced. And what he said is, for good or for bad, McDonald is the architect of basically Indian policy that lasted well into the 20th century, so almost 100 years. Well, what, it, what is that Indian policy? Well, 
we know about residential schools, right? And that's really probably one of the reasons why we're talking about this. This, uh, this slide at the bottom really gets me. This is from CBC News. And my father died about 15 years ago, okay? He was getting trained up to go to the Second World War, like he was in the Air Force, okay? And fortunately, I guess for me, the war ended before he got shipped over to Europe. But what gets me is, okay, the odds of being a kid in a residential school, of dying in residential school, were greater than people going to World War II. So more proportionally, more children died in residential school than people that went to fight in the World War II, more Canadians. Also, the, the hunger was institutionalized in residential schools. I'm not sure if you're familiar with my friend Ian Mosby's work. Basically, things, things were so bad for so long that children were experimented upon in the middle of the 20th century. You can see here, this is actually, I think, the title of something that's in the Canadian Medical Association Journal. A new article just came out. We were always hungry. And what it was, was it describes Basically, kids were malnourished for so long, stunted growth, their eyes didn't develop properly, they had problems through their entire lives. And I just cut and pasted this from the internet, and it points to be considered why the study is to be carried out in residential schools, and then, I won't read them all, but better cooperation can be expected within the residential school, because there weren't any parents around and there weren't anybody that cared for them. So these children were actually experimented upon. And what the experiments were, were like, can we give the kids a vitamin tablet? They're not getting enough food. They didn't have enough money for food. And this went on into the 1950s. Now, I was telling the Ukrainian folk last night, okay, there was also a concerted attack on indigenous governance, okay? So, so Canada really, they called it tribalism. But really what it was, was traditional forms of governance. So, you can see here, this is a picture of Big Bear and Poundmaker. Big Bear and Poundmaker were both sent to Stony Mountain Prison in the aftermath of 1885. I think they were tried for treason. Not surprisingly, both of those men and another chief named One Arrow got sick with clinical tuberculosis while they were in Stony Mountain. And they were, allowed, they were set free early so they wouldn't die in prison and become martyrs. And of course, both of those chiefs went home and died very soon after. So, there were imposed chiefs, many communities in Saskatchewan, I don't know what the situation was here in Treaty 7 territory, but there were some communities in Saskatchewan that didn't have a chief that were directly overseen by an Indian agent for 40 years. Like they just didn't have a leader in their communities. Okay. Now in November, this is an image of, I'm not sure if there are all eight of them there, but in November of 1885, we, we we have a play in Regina that's been playing, I'm not kidding, for 50 years called The Trial of Louis Riel, okay? I think it's mandatory that people have to go see it. But in Battleford, in November of 1885, it was the site of the largest mass execution in Canadian history. I think it was six Cree men and two Nakota men were hanged simultaneously. And this is the conversation that went on between Edgar Dudney, the Indian commissioner, and Johnny MacDonald. We want a circus. We want a public spectacle to make them think about their th sound thrashing. And McDonald says, yes, we want to convince the red man that the white man governs, okay? So they're, they're actually talking about turning this into a dog and pony show. And what they did was, they brought children from the industrial school, they provided rations at the hanging grounds, so people left their, were allowed to leave their communities and went to the hanging grounds. And according to the newspaper, there were so many people the night before that the planes were red with campfires, okay? So like who knows how many hundreds of people were there. Then as those eight men were hanged, their bodies were allowed to kind of swing in the wind for what the newspaper said was 20 minutes and there was not a sound. And what this was, was Canada saying, do not mess with us because this is what could happen to you. So like it was, it was purposely uh, created as like political theater. And like I said, uh, you know, that set the stage for a lot of things that are still happening. In 1885, after, after the violence, indigenous religious traditions, this is a Sundance circle, they were criminalized. So the level of control that the government had, now they're trying to control what people think and how people pray. Like we're in a place of worship. Think about the violence that would be if, if another tradition was imposed on you. Uh, this is kind of a messy slide. This is uh, my friend Sarah Carter's book. Some of you may know it, Lost Harvest. In, from 1881 on, 
And I double-checked with, a, with a, a colleague of mine, Carl Beale, he's an economist. From 1881 on, any farm produce grown on a reserve, for it to be sold outside of the reserve, you needed a written permit from an Indian department official. So I checked with my economist friend, even a turnip, yes, you needed a permit to sell a turnip, say, from Piapot in Regina, okay? So what that did was, that created a bureaucratic hurdle, and I'll show you how things went down. Okay? And this was actually continued well into, I've heard stories in the 1930s and 1940s. About this. I won't read this whole story, but this is my, uh, this make me remember this. This is, this is a story that probably took place during the Spanish flu epidemic in 1919. And it's called Why My Dad Went to Jail. And the writer is Alvina Drever. So the man has three daughters, okay? Two of them die in residential school of the flu. And the flu was terrible, a terrible mortality, okay? Two of them died in residential school, and another one of his daughters died in his home. So the man, according to the story, had two cows, okay? So he wants to sell a cow to build a coffins for his daughter. He wants to buy the wood, and he probably wants to buy that white satin for the interior of the coffin, okay? Well, the Indian agent says, you're not allowed to do it. Like, he actually says that. And the man's trying to bury his children, so he sells the cow without permission. And you can see here the last paragraph. A month later, the RCMP came to our home, and it ends up with, my dad spent three months in jail, okay? So there really wasn't a lot of humanity involved in the permit system if you decided, and I've heard stories of two different lineups at the grain elevator, right? And if the white guys showed up, they would get, get first come, first serve, and then if there was anybody, any First Nations people, they'd actually have a separate lineup and have to wait till all the white guys were done. Now, agriculture, I think that First Nations people really did want to develop agriculture. But what I'm proposing to you is that it was never really serious. This was more of a social experiment on the part of the government because they really didn't provide the infrastructure in order to turn uh, agricultural produce into food. So this is a, a comment from the newspaper, okay? You can grow oats and you can grow grain, but unless you have a, a mill, it's not food, it's, it's grass, right? And this is uh, from a geographical study in the 1970s. In 1884, Okay, this guy figured out that out of 20,230 First Nations people in Saskatchewan, only 770 were independent of rations, okay? So even eight or nine years after, the things weren't really working out, and they never really worked out because there were so many bureaucratic obstacles. For example, this is one of the crazier ones. In, 18, in 1889, there was a program called the Peasant Farming Policy that was imposed on First Nations. Have you folks heard of social Darwinism? This is like a crazy 19th century uh, hierarchy. Like, okay, it's totally bogus, but it's a view of, uh, from barbarism to peasantry to civilization up to probably the pinnacle is like Victorian England, okay? Someone in the Indian department got a hold of this crazy idea. And what they said is, oh, I know what the problem is. First Nations people have been hunters. They haven't been peasants. So we're going to turn, basically, indigenous farmers who are doing their best under terrible circumstances, we're going to take all of their mechanical implements away, their threshers and that kind of thing, and what we're going to do is we're going to give them hand tools, like hand scythes, okay? So to turn the people into peasants, okay? And this program was, in, was imposed for 15 years. There were many, many cases where the Indian agent is asking his boss can we please break out the thresher because the, the crops are literally rotting in the fields because the people can't cut them by hand fast enough. Ooh. So again, you've got, well, not only no incentive, like people are putting hurdles in your way. Now, again, I, I gave this uh, slideshow to the Ukrainians, and the Ukrainians during the First World War were considered to be enemy aliens. So during the First World War, many of the men were actually interned. I think they started to build Banff Park and they worked on a whole bunch of national parks. So when I showed this to the Ukrainians, they could kind of relate with, you know, the injustice of being put in a place where you're not allowed to leave. Well, after 1885, and this is a correspondence between, again, Edgar Dudney and Johnny MacDonald, and Dudney, Dudney was, uh, was efficient, and he, but he wasn't stupid, okay? And what he said is, is, and he's telling Johnny McDonald, who wants to basically imprison First Nations people on the reserve, he's telling his boss, to compel Indians to live wholly on the reserve, we have to alter the treaty. 
because the treaties guaranteed free mobility. Well, they didn't alter the treaty. What they did was they just ordered the Mounties to impose the pass system. And if any of you have seen my, I'm going to make a pitch for my friend Alex Williams' film called The Pass System. It's uh, very powerful, and he's done a lot of work to expose just how deep this pass system functioned. Okay? So here's a pass. Here's an example of a pass. Okay? And more and more are turning up, like in people's drawers and their grandparents' drawers and that kind of thing. This is one from 1932, and this man is from Beardy's First Nations. He's allowed to leave his reserve for two weeks to go big game hunting for food and is permitted to carry a gun. Okay? So the idea is, you're off your reserve, say you come to Lethbridge or Regina, someone could ask you if you have your pass. If you don't have your pass, you could go to jail for the night or you would probably be escorted back to your reserve. Okay? Now, remember just a couple minutes ago I told you about that, that, uh, that hanging that was an intimidation tactic, right? That was in November of 85. This is how the, the Saskatchewan Herald reported how the pass system was, uh, was being implemented in Battleford in the spring of 86. So there's a daily patrol of men that are traveling around Battleford. So think about it, there's a posse of white guys traveling around Battleford, okay? And what they're doing is they're shooing anybody out of town they can. But there's one woman, they just can't get her, like she won't leave town. So the newspaper continues, it uses a racist slur. The posse of white men grabs this woman, drags her to prison, okay? So who knows what's going on as they're dragging her to prison, and then they cut off all her hair, okay? And there's a lot of, uh, I shouldn't even be talking about hair, but it's very important. And you can see uh, an hour later, not a straggler left in town. So think about the intimidation tactic of a group of white guys grabbing a woman, taking her to jail, cutting off all her hair. She's probably freaking out, uh, rightfully so. So that's the kind of terror tactics that were used in, in imposing the system. And the system was completely illegal. There was no legal basis for it. And if an indigenous person had been able to hire a lawyer, the whole system would have fallen, place, fallen apart like a house of cards, except for the fact that in the early 20th century, it was illegal for a First Nations person to hire a lawyer. So here's another one. This man's from Carry the Kettle. He's allowed to go gopher hunting. Now, this system was in place for probably 70 years, okay? The path system. There's an awful lot of words on here. I apologize for doing that. That's my own poor computer work. This is an image of Dr. J.J. Haggerty. He's one of the preeminent Canadian doctors, okay? He wrote a two-volume history of, history of medicine in Canada. This is a correspondence from 1932 to Dr. E.L. Stone, who's a very high-ranking official in the Indian Department, and the title is The Indian and Tuberculosis, okay? So skip through all these words, and I'll read this, what I bolded. If the Indians were not segregated on reservations, we should be compelled to take better care of them for our own protection. So if we didn't incarcerate First Nations people on their reserves, they're so sick that they'd be a threat to us. So what they're doing is, like, we know how bad it is. Let's just keep them on reserves. Now, I won't read all of this, but this is how late the past system continued to function. This is, a, there's a correspondence, and what, what's happening is, there's going to be, at a museum in, uh, in Saskatoon, they've invited somebody from White Cap First Nation to come and to bring their regalia to add color to the festivities, I guess, in 1956. Okay? So there's an invitation. And this is the one I really want to show you. So this is the Indian agent, okay? And what he's doing is, yes, this is a very important thing, and permission is therefore given for them to be absent from their reserve from July 3rd to the 8th inclusive. So this is 1956, and the Indian agent is giving these guys permission to leave the reserve for five days, okay? Like, and again, there's no basis in law for this. It's just the amount of control they had. Now, Again, I showed this to the Ukrainians, and the Ukrainians were, were treated poorly when they came to Canada, were marginalized, but after the Second World War, they kind of came into their own, and they started to celebrate their own culture and had Ukrainian dancing. This is in Saskatoon. There's a huge Ukrainian festival in Dauphin. But what I reminded them was First Nations people weren't allowed to wear traditional, weren't allowed to wear their regalia unless they had permission from the Indian agent. So some of you probably have been to Banff Indian Days, 
in the old times, <laughs> that was the only time of year when people were allowed to wear their traditional clothing. It was against the law. So, it kind of brings us to our own society, right? And my, my, I guess my grandfather's Ukrainian, okay? He didn't have much of a future, and this is the way that Canada was sold to the people in Europe. And it was Europe at that time because we were overtly racist. And really, it's like, own your own farm, ready-made farm in Canada. I actually bought this poster when I was in Ottawa, for ironic reasons, the right land for the right man. So people in Europe, let's say in England or Ukraine or wherever it might be, they're being sold, like the, the, the idea of Canada, that it's free and that it's empty. Canada, your land for the asking, come and get it. Free farms for the millions, that seems pretty good, right? So our ancestors came here, and it's like, oh, okay, I guess the land is free. Like, let's, let's do what we got to do. Now, this is the one that kind of gets me. And this is, I think, from the early 20th century. And I, I think Leslie mentioned that I'm from Northern Ontario. So when I went to grad school in, in Manitoba, I had friends from, from Saskatchewan. And after a few beers, we'd be talking and making jokes. And they would always talk about the breadbasket of the world. And I really didn't know what they were talking about. But the breadbasket of the world is really like the, uh, the symbolic identity of Saskatchewan, right? Because it was the wheat province and all that stuff. But that identity, like the, you know, the breadbasket of the world, is based on the protracted malnutrition of the indigenous people. Like there was a, basically a controlled famine for decades. So that kind of changes the story for me. Now, Okay, just very briefly, you know, we've just been through the Gerald Stanley trial and the people, you know, like um, social media is up in arms. Well, Saskatchewan is a very odd place, okay? McLean's was actually so concerned about this. This was two or three years ago, and I was talking about how white Saskatchewan is. So, and what they did was they looked at pe people in positions of power. Well, we had zero indigenous mayors, we had one indigenous councillor, we had one MP, and we had two out of a hundred judges. So they were talking, even a couple, this is before the trial and everything, this is about two or three years ago, they were talking about how concentrated the power is in one ethnic group. But, and this is a little bit different, I think, from you folks, okay? This is the demographic projection of Saskatchewan. And my spouse works for the provincial government, she gave me this, but actually I gotta get a new one from her because the indigenous proportion, which says 33% in 2045, the new projection is more like 50% by 2050. So every day, Saskatchewan is more and more indigenous. So all of the inequity in education, we all know about the 30% deficit uh, of First Nations schools in comparison to the provincial schools. We know about overrepresentation in prisons. We know about overrepresentation in the medical system because people are so poor. And what I tell people is like, you may not want to do this for humanity, but when I'm you know, teaching health studies, if we don't do something about this in Saskatchewan, we're gonna go bankrupt building hospitals and prisons. Like it's, we gotta deal with this. And of course, the last couple of weeks have shown that we, how far we really have to go with this whole situation. Now, I was showing, again, I, was, you know, I tailored this talk to, to the Ukrainians. This is, um, this is a memorial in Regina to the Holodomor famine. And this is based, this, uh, this model, it's, it's actually a, a, an appropriately sized little girl who's undergoing famine. And this is, there are statues like this, I think there's one in Edmonton, and there's, there's, they're all cast from the same original that's in the Ukraine. So in Regina, we have a memorial to the Ukrainian famine, and right, rightfully so. Like I said, three million, three and a half million people died. But also in Regina, we had an industrial school. Okay, it operated for about 20 years. This is the graveyard of the Regina Indian Industrial School. Okay? Until a couple years ago, people had almost forgotten about it. Okay? And you can see here, it's in the spring. And I went to a ceremony out there and I actually had some two by 12s in my minivan and elders were walking across and actually put the, put the lumber down so they wouldn't actually get wet because you have to go through, there's no sidewalk. And there are only two headstones, and they're the children of one of the teachers at the industrial school. And there was an archaeologist that came, and she found 36 what she called site disturbances, long, thin holes in the ground that had been filled in, probably graves. So 
this graveyard, there had been crosses on it, but there was a prairie fire probably 50 or 60 years ago, and the church had, I think it was the Presbyterians that ran this one, the church had moved out by then, so no one was in a position to, uh, to memorialize these children who had died. And, okay, just to put it into perspective, it took the city three years of negotiations to mark this as a heritage property, right? So it, it still doesn't have a plaque, it's just they're not going to build anything on it. So, again, talking about the Holodomor famine, okay, and I brought this up. Raphael Lemkin was the man who coined the term genocide, and he actually wrote about genocide before the end of the First World War, okay? And what he was talking about, he wasn't specifically talking about the Holocaust. One of his subjects was the Ukrainian famine and the way that the Soviets had treated the Ukraine by basically colonizing them, by replacing their institutions, by retraining their children, and by starving them out. So, Lincoln's discussion here, objectives of such a plan would be the dis disintegration of the political and social institutions. And just think about my little story that I told you, of culture, language, national feelings, religion, and the economic existence of national groups, the destruction of per personal security, liberty, health, dignity, and even lives, okay? And later on in 1948, the United Nations had a convention on genocide, and one of their criteria for genocide was the taking of children from one group and re-socializing them by another group, because that's what the Soviets did in, in Ukraine. Okay, now I'm not going to push you that the story I just told you was one of genocide, but it looks to me like it's on the same road, right? The government of Canada went on a mission to destroy the institutions, to destroy the identity, and to destroy, to destroy the lives of people. Now, that's not a very happy ending, um, but I think it's something we got to think about. And like I said, you know, it, I, I don't even know where I am on this thing, but I know that a lot of these things, taken in context, pertain to our relationship, our Canada's relationship to First Nations people. So I guess with that, I'll stop talking and I'll take a drink of water and answer any questions if you got them. So thanks for listening to me. Right. Oh, thanks. So as you get a drink, I'd like to um, invite you in just one more second to perhaps offer your applause one more time. There's two things that really strike me about Jim's comments. Of course, the first is the amount of passion and energy and time and work that goes into all of this. I think you can agree this really is um, a life's work. The second thing I'd like to have three coffees. Good for you. That's another thing. Caffeine's another good motivator. The other thing I'd like to point out, I think I can speak for the other pastors retired and active in the room, that to be the only person on a stage in front of a group of people and then to call people's attention to things that people might not want to look at or think about is really not very easy to do. So I do commend not only your passion but also your courage. So perhaps we could give Jim a little bit of on a book, and that uh, reception is just through the door on my right. But before that, we'd like to take a moment to, um, to ask him a few questions, and Mary's going to lead us through that. Yes, and what I would ask you to do, uh, we have a mic, Joanna's here with a mic, and so she will come to you. If you have a question, please put your hand up, and then and we'll ask you to stand up with your question, and give us your name, and ask the question. And, and then uh, Jim will answer it. I'll try. Jim will try. Okay. 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 I just want to commend you for the job you did. I know when 
book first came out, it was actually a colleague of mine who recommended I read it. I didn't know anything about it, but I remember posting on social media after reading it that I take my hat off to you. And, uh, you know, it's pretty tough, I think, like the gentleman just said there, when, when you're talking about things that my people have lived and looking at my grandkids and what they're up against in the future today, I think telling the truth makes a big difference and for you folks to come out and listen to the truth because that's what I say when I tell other people to read the book because you did your research, it's all documented. And I know in our communities, we always say, can you I not be quite on you? So if a white man says it, it must be true. <laughs> I also wanted to just add one point, like even with Palm Maker, a lot of people don't realize this Palm Maker was buried on the Siksika Reserve. That's where he died. And they actually exhumed his body and brought him back to Saskatchewan. So they couldn't claim the territory too. But, uh, you know, one thing with talks like this, and I guess people all come to listen because they want to learn something. And if I could just add a comment, maybe not a question, just adding to the research and stuff that, that you've done. I know the chief of Onion Lake last year, over he borders Saskatchewan and Alberta there. But a few years ago, the federal government put out legislation that all First Nations had to present and make public all their financial documents from getting federal money. And last year, Chief Fox, is his name, took the crown to court. And this is something you never hear about in the media or anything, but there's a lot of First Nations that don't report anymore because when Chief Fox took the crown to court, they proved that the money First Nation people are getting is their own money. Because of exactly like what you were saying, the way First Nations couldn't sell anything, lands and trusts, oil and gas money, all that money is in trust in Ottawa. And the interest off those trillions of dollars is what pays and goes to First Nations. So that's a myth that really needs to be, be debunked. And I just wanted to add that on to your speech. I, I, you know, again, I thank you, and thank you folks for listening to me. Okay, good to see you, James. Uh, James and I go back a few years, and uh, he has uh, put a tremendous presentation, and him and I visit many years ago, and uh, the word you'll read it in the book, needs it up in. Hello, my name is Mike Brewstead, it's a guy in England. Danny Cohen in Abix. And the guy who's saying it's a of it's a boy needs a. Oh, you start with that. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. All of you have heard this, some of you a few times here in Lethbridge. You all have a duty this evening, either buy the book or transfer this knowledge you heard tonight to those people that may not want to hear it. Transfer to your kids and especially your children, your grandchildren. These are the injustices. And like my brother Jared just said, sometimes when the white man writes and talks about it, then it must be the truth. So you're hearing it from James. I want to put a, a bug in your ear here in the city of Lethbridge. And I said this a few, uh, about a year ago when James spoke at the public library. There's history, there's gotta be some uh, written documentation 
right in the general area of the Lethbridge College, the present Lethbridge College, there was a ration house. And you heard the, the spoiled meat, putting lye on the, the, the meat to kill the, the bacteria. Well, my grandfather used to tell me, you made this signal, the ration house, a big one over here. And again, me and the permit system, leave the blood reserve, that's about 10 minutes away. And the, the sadness of the story, starvation time. Uh, elder, a grandmother, grandfather, and her daughter. Their daughter must have been about maybe seven or eight months pregnant and had a young son. And so the woman's husband had to sneak off and, and try and hunt. Anyways, they were so hungry, they ate that meat that was contaminated. And uh, they didn't make it to across the river. They're that hungry, they start cooking it. They died, either on top of the uh, west side of the now present college or towards the river bottom. I think the city should put a monument. We put monuments all over. I think we need to put a monument here in Lethbridge. And this one guy, Dudney, was one powerful son of a gun. He controlled a lot of lives. He controlled a lot of people that died. And this IG Baker is all kind of books on him. He made good money. A.J. McDonald made good money. And talk about conflict of interest. Now we've got all these parliamentary ethics and what have you. But these are things that need to come up and be said. We're all in here for this reconciliation exercise tonight. And if you people be in it, you have a, a community here, push forward on those agendas. Share what you heard tonight. Share it at your kitchen table. Share it at your Sunday picnics. You never get any warm weather. <laughs> but share this. Let go of that defensive thing. You've heard the facts. You've heard the injustices. I think the quicker you accept those not blaming yourself, but accepting those, that is your own part of this reconsideration exercise. This path that is being used quite lo loosely, truth and reconciliation. I think internally, psychologically, your own emotions, you reconcile with the truth, you're on your way. And if you deny, then you got a long ways to go. And I can imagine what you can tell your children, grandchildren, relatives, whatever. That denial. That denial has to let go. Let it blow in the wind. Since we've got a lot of winds, let it blow east someplace. <laughs> so James, I want to thank you. And for using that word, need sympathy. I'm proud you did that many years ago. But uh, I didn't know where James was heading to with this research many years ago. And I'm glad he didn't uh, quit. He didn't quit up on me, and he didn't quit on you people. So thank you very much. I don't have a question. I just want to share that. Thank you. Thank you. four or five years, basically on, on this theme. And this has happened to me at least four, maybe five times, okay? So the first time was, I think, in, uh, in the west side of Saskatoon. So Station 20 West was like a very mixed crowd. So after my talk, I'm signing books, I'm kind of spun out for my talk, and there was a Métis woman, and she, she's getting me to sign a book, and she's like, oh, thank you for writing this book. And I'm kind of, you know, like, oh, I did my best, I didn't really know what to say. She said, Thank you for being white and writing this book. So she could see, like, the, like what? Like, get, like, the mouse is turning the wheel in my head. And she said, because we wrote it, they just say we were complaining. So that was a real lesson to me. Like, the response I get, and I'm trying to, I've got a voice, because I'm white. I'm trying to use that voice properly. So, thanks. <laughs> <laughs>
chief in 1877. So his blood runs through my blood. And I'd just like to commend James from my heart for sharing this type of information. Today, I feel hurt. Also, I feel angry. But life has to move on. Life has to move on. Changes have to be made. This true truth and reconciliation we're all talking about. I'm finally glad these kind of gatherings here were speaking about the truth. The real things that really happen. Because a lot of people immigrating to Canada or into the provinces were never recognized. We're always left at the in the black burner. But still some things that still really hurt me today. Even though this presentation was from Saskatchewan, a little bit about the black folk. Same thing happened here. I had a grandmother that used to tell me stories. And with these epidemics that took place. This is the winter was so cold. We could bury our people that died from these epidemics. There's a place back home where I come from, a little box that we live in, which we call a reserve. There's a place they call Ghost Coulee. The ground was so froze, babies, old people, they would tie them on the travels and lean them against the hillsides. This is for so many of that coolie are people that have died. So sometimes I still feel for my people. I still feel the pain of those little babies that were crying. Nothing we can do. Seeing your old people dying in front of you seeing your mother and father dying in front of you. Those pain I still carry today. And today that I see today in our communities, whatever has happened in the past, still happening on our nations. But I'm really glad that we gotta continue speaking the truth. I go to different schools, there's a few schools that were local, right next to our reserve. High school students, I went to talk to them. And I told my neighbors, right next door, we should learn to get along. We shouldn't be so racist to each other. We should learn to communicate. But I told them at the time, your grandfathers and your grandparents are not telling you the truth. That we existed here first. Alberta writes big posters out and that are out there that say big ranches were built here in 1886 or whatever. So the grandchildren believe that. They think that their grandparents were here first. We never got acknowledged for that. So when I went to that school, and I told them, this is how it was. This is what happened here. And the sad thing about it, I wasn't ever called back to that school. Because I was speaking the truth about what was taking place. So these kind of presentations, Part of the schooling systems. Why are they hiding the truth? They should be implementing those kind of stories and teaching the young people today. So that way someday we can all get along and we can move on in life. There's so much sad things that have happened and there's so much repair that needs to be done.
So today, I'm really thankful that I'm, I'm honored to be here. But there's a term that I always kind of think about. I was in, I was in Kananaskis Lodge. I went to do a presentation on some health issues about the black people. The whole building where they were having the gathering, there's little doors you have to go in there. The conference already started. So I went over there and I opened it, one of the doors and I looked from one end and I looked down the other end. There was this, there was not one Indian in there in that building. He came back out and I'm standing there and says, so this is how Astor must have really felt being alone in here with all these people. But anyway, thank you very much for hearing me out. And I'm glad we start to speak about the truth. Because that's how things are going to change. That's how we're going to learn to respect each other. We're people too. And thank you very much. So it, it's actually rule in Saskatchewan that teachers have should they should be dealing with these issues. Some and you know like some schools are more advanced, some aren't, I guess. Um, but I've personally been into probably 25 schools, either talking to kids and kids as young as grade five and grade six, and it's a good challenge for me to explain those things in you know simple words. Um, but also to, to train teachers, and so. These days at the, at the teacher's college, I know at University of Regina, uh, there are new teachers being trained up in social justice education. So they're, they're training their students, and I think the, the change is gonna come with the kids, right? And I've got three daughters, and it's in, like I've noticed this myself. When children are very young, they're trained the difference between right and wrong. It's very simple, right? This is right, that's wrong. But it's terrible as a parent, as, you, as they get older, you have to explain things. Okay, yeah, that's an injustice, but here's the rationale for that injustice. As kids get older, there's more and more gray that's put in there. So I guess to some extent, this might be a challenge for all of us. If you see something, you know, call it out. Or if you're with a kid, say that's all right. Because, I mean, if we don't say anything, we don't do anything when we have the chance, that chance is lost. So thank you. Thanks for coming. Go ahead. Hey, Dr. James, thank you very much. You're sitting right perfectly here for what I was going to ask. My name is Jocelyn Pelche. I do teach high school here in Lethbridge. Uh, I have had a glimpse at the newly being written right now as we speak, Alberta curriculum uh, for the English department. And not only is there an entire section dealing with all of this, there it's riddled and dripped throughout almost every page of what's to come in our curriculum. Um, and amongst my closest strangers here, I can confess that I knew but a drop of what you said tonight. And so I'm going to have to go back to my classroom at some point in the coming year or two and speak to this. But without experts to bring in on a daily, weekly, monthly, yearly basis, can you help me? Where are we going to start? Where am I going to start? Because I don't have any of this knowledge that you've spent your entire life <laughs> researching. So where are the tens of thousands of us teachers going to get this from? Well, I, I work with teachers, and actually they're uh, there are a few teachers, even in Regina, that are doing all kinds of really innovative work with regard to, say, treaty education. So one example was, I went into my, I'm a, I'm a retired ultimate Frisbee player, so I went into my old Frisbee teammate's class, she teaches grade 11, 
uh, Indigenous Studies at Tom Collegiate in Regina. It's a very mixed school. And what she did was, I didn't know this at the time, I'm gonna give, I was gonna give a slideshow, so I'm sitting around, the bells ringing, and the kids are moving around, and I turned to a kid, and it's like, hey kid, how's it going? And she said, well, I'm not that good, I got kicked off the res. And she was serious, and she was looking at me, I'm like, oh, okay, but sorry I asked. Uh, but it turned out that my friend Kim had organized a role, a role game that lasted the entire term, and that, and actually she picked kind of the white jocks, like, you know, the most popular kids, and she said, okay, well, actually, you kids have died, so you're not allowed to talk for the rest of the term. You go sit in a corner. Anyhow, so she developed this whole scenario, and what it is is the kids kind of go through the experience. So the kid who got kicked off the res, okay, like, that I thought she was serious about, okay, my friend Kim said, well, if you filled out your paperwork, you could probably get back on the res. Those are the kinds of things that still go on, right? You need to go through all those administrative hurdles and that kind of thing. So there are, I think there are a lot of uh, innovative ways to teach kids. If you give me your email, I'll, I'll put you in touch with some uh, teachers that have got things going in Regina, and I'm sure they'd be happy to help. The other thing, uh, we have Wendy Culkin. Wendy, can you send up, please? Uh, Wendy is involved with Kairos and uses the, the blanket exercise with the, the indig indigenous people also working with her. And if I'm understanding correctly, the, the school division, the teachers at the convention voted to have that included in their, in their schools. Is that correct? Uh, that's correct. The school district 51. So this is Wendy, and you can ask her, as a teacher, you can ask her about the blanket exercise. And it's a very experiential exercise about Turtle Island, which is what we live in and what happened with the blankets. I'm a school thinker. Have you heard of... Um, Project of Heart. Okay, write that down on a napkin and Google it. So that's another one that's um, that that's a long-term thing. Like it lasts several weeks, and that one's been very successful. So I think that that might be actually be working with Kairos as well. Okay? Project of Heart. Yeah. So that's another one that's not just uh, say someone being a talking head feeding children information. They're actually experiencing. Is there one more question? Yeah, there's a... Oh, Annalise, oh. Sorry. Mike's over there, Deb, sorry. Hi, thanks for your talk. Um, when you talk about the passing system, it made me think of a system that's quite actively being practiced in leverage. It's called carding. And um, a prominent lawyer here in Lethbridge did a FOIA of the Lethbridge Police database and showed that one in five people who are indigenous will get stopped. So it's a practice that's kind of still very relevant here today. Is there one more? Oh, it's two over here. <laughs> Uh, Johanna, you gotta go around. So 
I guess the, the situation is if you got people who are marginalized, they don't have any power, and then they're in an institutional setting, you know, like, uh, and Gary Giddings, who's actually coming in the next couple of weeks, you should probably go to his talk too. It's on the brochure. It's on the brochure. <laughs> uh, anyhow, what, what the way Gary describes it is you've got the residential schools, and then the re so many kids were sick from the residential schools that they ended up going to the Indian hospitals. So it was almost like a feeder system. And uh, those lasted until the 1960s. And actually, um, just outside of, of Regina at Fort Capel, there was an old tuberculosis sand that was built uh, actually 100 years ago, 1917, 1918. Then there was another generation, it was an Indian hospital that functioned through the 1950s and 60s, and I guess into the 70s probably. And then there was actually a new generation of hospital because there's so many indigenous communities around there that there's an all nations healing hospital now that's actually run on indigenous principles and its board of governors are indigenous. So in that one community, there's like, you know, sort of the, the generations. So, uh, oh yeah, then I was gonna ask you what your second question is, short attention span. Uh, the, the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People. So uh, I believe candidate Trudeau mentioned that, that you know, the new government was gonna be accepting you know, those principles wholesale. And very soon after, and it was funny, I was in Victoria, and I'm not sure if any of you folks are familiar with Tiagi Alfred, an indigenous scholar from the, from the West Coast. One of my former students was doing her master's with them in indigenous governance. So it was literally, uh, what was it? I think it was January of 2016. You know, somebody's still probably painting the door of Prime Minister Trudeau's office, right? So the question after my sad talk, much like this, was, well, what's happening with the new government, right? And I said, well, it's only been in power for eight weeks, so I guess I'll cut him some slack, and I'm cautiously optimistic. And in the back, my student Jacqueline Annapod and, and her friends who were doing their masters, they weren't saying anything, but they were, you know, like giving me the no sign so strong it was like they were yelling at me. And because I knew Jacqueline, I said, what? You tell me. And she said, well, the liberals always talk the talk, but they don't usually, like, you know, that's their MO, they talk about it, but never do things. Now, We'll see because there was like a, I think they talked about a made in Canada under solution. But I, they might have actually gone back and let them have a hard time following their position. But uh, I was just in Japan where there were indigenous scholars from around the world, indigenous activists from around the world. And the Sami in Scandinavia, the Maori, uh, indigenous Hawaiians were all talking about the UN Declaration as, as the model. So I guess that, like I learned from them, that, that should be the model. And it'll probably be, we'll probably force a reorganization of how we run things in Canada, but maybe it's time. <coughs> Bob right. Uh, you uh, seem to open up by suggesting that much of this was related to the Rupert's Land Purchase and the, uh, <coughs> the legalities that related to that transaction. I'm just wondering how the treatment of indigenous people in basically Saskatchewan and that, that Alberta that you referred to compared to Ontario, Quebec, and how the, indigenous, the government treated indigenous populations in those areas. You know, that's, uh, that's a good question. So, say in the 1870s and 1880s, and I've actually been uh, a bit criticized by a retired professor from the University of Calgary. He's, he's a generation older than me, so even though I'm 56, I'll always be a kid to him. Now, Don Smith, he's a retired historian from the University of Calgary. And so we've had a polite disagreement. We've emailed and we've talked about it. And he said, McDonald wasn't all that bad. Okay? Like, he wasn't like, yeah, you did your things. But he said in Ontario, he was advocating to give First Nations people the right to vote. Of course, they never got it. They didn't get it until 1960. But in Ontario, say the Haudenosaunee people in southern Ontario, the land around their territory was fully occupied by basically European immigrants. So they weren't a threat, they weren't perceived as a threat to the development policy. Out here, when all these things went down, there were only a few hundred white settlers, like a few in Battleford, some in Prince Albert, and um, you know, Fort Edmonton was an old fur trading post. So McDonald, what I, from my perspective, McDonald could be friends with people like uh, the indigenous missionary Peter, whose English name is Peter Jones, 
right? He could be friends with them because he was no threat. Because like, like I said, Kingston was, was built around the indigenous community. But out here, the fact that McDonald acted in a very different way with some people was a sign to me that he was tactical. Like he knew what he was doing. He wasn't like a cartoon racist that like any indigenous people were bad. Like, so from my, like my interpretation of this, he, like, he perceived who should be uh, marginalized and who should be oppressed. And basically that was the indigenous population out here because he wanted to get that railway built and he wanted the land opened up for settlement. He kind of got his, like, you know, mission accomplished, right? Well, I think we uh, need to give Jim another round of applause.